Okay, so I want to call up the panelists now. So Flood Günther is not here. He wants to like lead the panel. The panel is of, we changed it slightly, like Ali, Lambert, and uh, Ismail. And uh, can you come here for the panel, please? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you want, okay, yeah. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, we just take a seat here, okay? Yeah, so we changed it a little bit. So what is blockchain and what is blockchain for science? Yeah, we, uh, we were, like when we first designed the conference, we were into the techni uh, techni uh, technicalities and now we are like more on a definition level, right? So we can just take a seat, okay? I mean, the one that didn't speak, it's only you. Okay, you just introduce you for like in like two lines. Is that okay? And like how you ended up here at the panel, oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Mo, and uh, I'm CEO of Setter Network, working on off-chain scalabilities. And uh, I'm here uh, because we just came back from the DevCon, and uh, this is an awesome event, and we want to chime in uh, what we're thinking as a platform builder and how to contribute for science for blockchain. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So, so okay. So, what is blockchain? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. So we have the technical stuff. We discussed it. And I just want to like ask you, you said like one limitation is, uh, is uh, energy consumption. Yes. And do we all agree with that? Like this is like true for certain blockchain setups, right? True. It's not I, because I said, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just mentioned energy yeah. consumption of the uh, well-established systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's yeah. not necessarily true. I mean, if you use proof of stake, for instance, yeah. you don't waste exactly. energy in that way as well. So yeah, there are other chains, or if you use a consortium, a private yeah. chain, where a uh, civil control mechanism is just, oh, this set of nodes is preset and you cannot change that, well, then you don't need proof of work as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, this is like one misconception, right? Uh, we just want to clean away, right? Uh, some, some well, the fact that is that uh, still the, the well-known like well established systems, yeah. like Bitcoin or yeah. Ethereum, waste loads of energy. <laughs> yeah. And, and then there's like one thing people say, like blockchain, it will expose all data to all people all the time. So it's just a design question, right? You can design it in. True. Um, there are also other projects, like I mentioned Zcash, for instance, yeah. that tries to hide the, the transactions. Um, they use uh, something, they use advanced cryptography, something called ZK SNARKs, uh, which is like zero knowledge proofs. And um, this uh, is also ongoing research and there are many, many new interesting advances in this area and we probably will see something. Um, actually, ZK SNARKs are also a scalability solution because you can kind of compress what you have in a succinct, succinct which like kind of means short proof. Uh, what happened. So if you think of tr state transitions, you could also have a short proof, like from the genesis block to the current block, uh, what happened in that in this time using ZK SNARKs. So there's loads, as I said, there's ongoing research, but there's loads of things going on there. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing about ZK SNARKs is it doesn't only solve mm. uh, uh, privacy, but also scalability. Okay. To some extent, yes. Sorry? To some extent. Yeah, yeah. To some extent, yes. Yeah, so Everything we have like this, extent. there's a cap theorem, even the graffiti artist put it, there's a triangle with a cap on top, yeah, the CAP, and uh, there are a lot of people in blockchain space that want to like solve this problem, but to square this cap, tri this cap triangle, it would be re really revolutionary if you would have a system. So we, are, we all need to be skeptic, but we have like several like uh, real world trade-offs, as you mentioned, right, exactly. and you too, okay? Yes. So uh, which one is the best, and like even the state channels on top of a blockchain system, they are not decentralized, right, but they have interesting new reproductions, yeah? So these are, the, so we, I'm pretty fine with all the technical things that we discussed in terms of blockchain up until now, right? And in the beginning we had like, well, we need cultural changes, right? So where do we see blockchain in science that we can like support cultural changes in science? Well, we have like the time stamping now. Uh, well, we could like also send our hashes to Elsevier, right? So, but I if mean, you, I mean, they can manipulate them? it, right? But yeah, okay. So, but we have like one thing, the time stamping of science. There were, I was at a conference once and there was a guy who said like, a blockchain, the only thing that blockchain really does is 
decentralized time stamping of anything, a, a friend of him told him. So he was a blockchain skeptic, yeah? blockchain application in science. Okay? I think it's great, and this is the right thing, blockchain does time stamping in a decentralized way. And it's as good as saying the internet is only good for sending bytes around, right? It's as useful as uh, it's useless, yeah? So, okay, it depends on what we timestamp and what we do with the data on top, yeah? And, and I would argue that uh, actually blockchain can offer a lot more than just timestamping. And uh, uh, in the specific context of science and scientific research, um, you know, there is a lot of things we can do on the crypto economic side. And the uh, one uh, specific topic that I want to introduce to the audience is something called token curated registry, uh, TCR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is good. We, we, we were heard talk about this, and this brings us to the crypto economy, right? This whole new token stuff. So you would sub summarize that under blockchain too? Includes the crypto economy? Yeah. Under the term? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you know, ju just to give a brief view, overview of it. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry, oh. sorry, sorry. No, right, no. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah. uh, just to give a quick uh, overview of uh, uh, TCR, uh, what is TCR? You no, can no, think no, we will have this later. We will have this tomorrow. Oh. It's, a, it's a perfect, we will have a talk on that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So no, 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 we'll no I, just, yeah. I just want to, like, like, let's talk on the level, like, what is blockchain and, like, we will sub summarize crypto economy about it, yeah? Sure, yeah. yeah we will have a talk on that tomorrow, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, and so, so I would say that blockchain is a new way, uh, there was, like, this thing, blockchain can be used for everything, and blockchain is not useful for everything, you know? We have, like, these both things, like, well, and I think it, it comes of, do you agree with the statement? It's like, well, blockchain is just a new way to organize all online stuff, right? So and if you can represent something online, like fashion, like science, like anything, basically, right, you could do it in a blockchain way, right? So what does this represent to you? If you think of like we have the centralized third parties at the moment that provide services, and I want to include institutes to this that are open science institute publishers, mind being archive, but it's also centralized, right? If they shut down, they shut down, right? So, uh, so to have like a, let's say an open access journal on IPFS, it's to me, it's more open science than to have a centralized open access repository somewhere, right? And uh, so to, uh, to uh, uh, like to define what, what blockchain means is that you organize an online service that we already had in a distributed way. They are not just, just some plugs that you can pull, but you have to pull a lot to stop Bitcoin. In other blockchain, it's like decentralized. That means that there's like no central entity that can, can manipulate the system. And it's like, it can be immutable, right? It can't be changed arbitrarily. It can only be changed as described. And it's like provable to the outside. And then, and then one guy from a research institute came to me, well, we had systems to design provable systems in 30 years. Yeah? But it's, and then I want to like bring it to the hype. It's also a hype because we are sitting talking about these things right now here, right? And not 30 years ago when they had the system to make a computer system provable. Yeah? Is it okay? So I'm, I'm, uh, like, <laughs> no, I mean, like, what, what, what's your, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, is it, like, so, thank uh, you. So y y you're mixing up a lot of uh, things. And, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I must admit that uh, uh, as a uh, uh, professor, I have a strong opinion on almost all of, all of these uh, things you brought up. So uh, let me let me maybe first um, kind of sort it. Um, start with uh, maybe cryptocurrencies. So what I think is. Um, a lot of people are afraid of regulations and so on. I think it is the best thing that can happen if it is regulated. Because, you know, if it's regulated, it kind of uh, uh, leads to uh, uh, trust. And uh, if people trust, uh, this leads kind of to acceptance. And if people ac accept it, then they use it. So it's, it's a kind of a, an easy path. Uh, for um, the uh, trade-offs, uh, we talked uh, a lot about them, all these designs. And, you know, all these things like anonymity and uh, um, so it's, it's, they have their own benefits and they have their drawbacks. So for, for, for open science, you know, there, there, is, there is countries in the world right now, in the 21st century, where people are afraid to tell their opinion, like what I do. I openly say you what I think. They can't. So sometimes anonymity is good. 
because then they can timestamp that they were the first who brought up the idea. And they are not have to be, they don't have to be afraid that they will have some negative consequence because of saying this. On the other side, anonymity is sometimes yeah, yeah, criticized yeah. because, you know, if we kind of publish a scientific paper and somebody criticizes it, even maybe without reasons or with good reasons, but it's done not in a polite way because of this anonymity, it's sometimes also not good. So it, it is, everything has its benefits and its drawbacks and it, 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 it depends on the context and that's what, 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 what I kind of struggle with uh, uh, here guys is that we mix it up as Zonke, this no, was the no, best no, introduction, okay. yeah, yeah, we perfect. mix it up I, I told you in the end of my talk open science is quite big and it, I don't need a particular specific kind of use case we should talk about but it is completely different where what matters and for sure for every of the single questions, I guess blockchain may, or kind of the underlying technology, DLT, may provide some opportunities that we maybe could go for. Okay, thanks. I mean, um, there are a lot of ways you can th uh, think of blockchain. You can think about blockchain from a technology point of view, which is like a, a kind of a decentralized ledger or decentralized state machine progression. Uh, but another way you can think about blockchain is from like an application point of view, right? So uh, from the uh, communication, uh, from the uh, scientific society, and also like, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this community, the way I would like to say uh, blockchain is, is basically a way to create the decentralized trust. Right, so it's basically uh, this thing that uh, can create trust among mutually untrusted parties in the, uh, you know, uh, in the old world, right? So be, be, uh, you, you and I can all trust each other. And uh, uh, for example, in the timestamping uh, case you mentioned, um, if we have like a notary, uh, notary service, maybe you cannot even trust any notary service in the beginning if it is like a huge Nobel, um, you know, uh, bonding uh, discovery. Uh, but with blockchain, you can actually trust that this thing actually happened. And with TCR, the same thing that you can basically create kind of uh, this kind of decentralized trust among a trust party. So if that, that is like a one sentence definition I would give for blockchain to this community. But, but do we have a trust problem? Like if I submit my paper to a publisher, and it will like be received on this date, we trust them, right? I mean, uh, there's no scientist that argues with Springer uh, uh, like putting a wrong timestamp on my paper. There are cases where people yeah. submitted their papers to conferences, and then the peer reviewer, they oh. really liked the idea so much that they declined the paper and published it themselves. Ah. So this is documented. That really yeah. happened. Okay, okay. That's why we also have an extension for uh, an open journal submission system, so yeah. that when you submit your paper to a conference, it's automatically timestamped. Yeah. I have to add, Bella, you're absolutely right. And you know what? Why we need sometimes blockchain or this trustless trust in our community, in the scientific community? Because we scientists, per definition, per principles, per our identity, don't trust each other. Even me on my own, if I don't know the authors, if they are not coming from the institution, I kind of am aware of. If they are not publishing in a journal I trust, I read, I don't even take a look at the paper. And that might be, might, be, might be bad. That might be evil because maybe they have kind of something in it that is, that is just, 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 just true. But this, is, so this would solve a lot of problems. And the cases Sabella mentioned, they are really true. It's so sad that they are true. I think it's very true and it's good that we uh, are s skeptical. I mean, just in the news a few days ago, they found out that there was a bug in, in Bitcoin that uh, would have made, uh, under some circumstances, double spending possible. Yeah, I mean, mm. that's something we all agree, of course, that's not possible with Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. But even in that system, it was designed to achieve that it was possible. Yeah. So we have to be skeptical. Yeah, but we can, and we can like... Uh, yeah. Okay, Lamba, do you want to add something? Or? Yeah. yeah, let me maybe introduce to, 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 uh, to give a little bit of another perspective on why uh, we benefit from this uh, trustlessness of a protocol. Uh, let me introduce an example of blockchain in uh, another but close field, and that is uh, higher education. So since two years or so, you have several institutions uh, worldwide who uh, notarize, uh, allow um, people to notarize um, educational certificates, so for instance diploma and so on, on a blockchain. And this is huge. Imagine uh, mm. a country like Malta, they even changed their legislation to, to support this. And why do they do this? As you maybe know, 
Malta has like hundreds or thousands of language schools for some weird reason. I, I never get this why, but for some reason it's hugely popular to travel to Malta and learn mm. some language. So, but what happens now is some school, some language school go, goes down the drain. Yes. Or take, for instance, Hungary. <coughs> they they uh, just uh, outlawed one major university within their country for political reasons. So there are lots of reasons mm. why you do not have this, want to rely on the yeah. trust relationship okay. to your alma mater on the long run, but instead have a proof that you received some uh, uh, okay. uh, certificate on the blockchain. And this yeah. is a well-established case. They even have standards yeah. governing this use case and so on. And we can learn a lot from this. Yeah. Imagine this kind of autonomy for learners applied to researchers, that they literally own the transactions between them. And there it's not about receiving a grade for your diploma, but it's about other forms of assessment, like, for instance, peer review. Yes. Yeah. And this, this is or, super or, important. Or, 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 or you submit an idea, right? And uh, you can collect likes for the idea, for example, yeah? Or people like retweet your idea, right? And then we can, like in blockchain world, we could create new economies around that, yeah? We can, this is not possible in ResearchGate because we know that ResearchGate people can sit down in theory or Springer Nature people or LCV people and can change the likes with their admin password in the database, right? This Have is it. super yeah. important, super, yeah. because right. as a librarian, I'm very much concerned about the economy of information markets. And this has potentially a huge impact of how these markets work. Because if, 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 if you imagine a world where, where like learners own their certificate, where researchers own all kinds of transactions between them, yeah? in a very literal sense, N not in this figurative meaning of, oh, we have some kind of peer-to-peer -peer network. No, literally, yes, they own this. Then you have these kinds of information potentially as a commons, so people can build there are business models for like uh, uh, delivering analysis of this data and so on, uh, upon this, but there is no privileged access to this kind of information. And this is a huge difference to what happens today. We, day by day, we rely on closed platforms. We got used to it, right? And these uh, valuable branded platforms, they have privileged access to certain types of information and they make use of it. And we can bring, so this is my hope at least, yeah, right? Yeah. So, uh, an end to this. So there's a decentralization, right? We yeah. don't have a central third party anymore that can uh, manipulate the data, right? Who owns the data? They, they, they don't, yeah, they don't yeah. own it anymore, right? I mean, yeah. but this brings problems as well, right? If you don't have a centralized entity that can manipulate the data anymore, then we don't have a centralized entity that can manipulate the data anymore. And this is like the problem is like whoever has like experience with running an internet service is like understands how hard it is to maintain the database in a state that it's useful to the people. You don't want to have 300 articles, the same articles with different numbers or identities, right? They are like, at big companies like Facebook, there are a lot of mechanical Turks working to cleaning up the database so that it's useful, right? If we don't have this anymore, we need to like build game incentives, structures around so that people maintain a good database. And that's a tough problem for many things, right? For you, Bitcoin you, transaction, it's easy, right? You in just in, like in a way, re, you really have to re-establish trust and reinvent some aspects of information markets. Yeah, I, I yeah, and, so. yeah, and make it so that the people decentralized become curator of this data, of this service, right? And there are a lot of, we have projects that work on this and they understand that it's a tough problem. Yeah, so maybe centralized, dash decentralized services will be combined in the future. Or we will we, we'll see like centralized services exist for low value transactions and for how high value transactions like grant money distribution and things, we might have a blockchainified thing. Is that a possible future? I mean, uh, yeah? I think I think centralized centralized services can still exist. Uh, in yeah. the sense that it can be a major or main participant of some decentralized systems. 
right? So uh, imagine like we have this awesome journal that is newly established, and uh, you know the old school publishers can still be a participant in the token uh, the TCR, for example, yeah, token yeah. creator research. Yeah. And uh, this is like entirely possible. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add some more skepticism to this whole decentralization idea. For instance, in, in if you trust a well-established institution, for instance, uh, your bank, and you lose your credit card or someone tampers with your credit card and buys something, you can go and complain and get your money back. If there is no such central institution, you, you for instance, the Bitcoin equivalent is someone steals your private key, your money's lost. Yeah. There's nothing you can do, you cannot, there's nothing you can, no one you can talk to. Exactly. So this is another problem. Yeah, I, I don't think that decentralization per se um, is something we should always try to achieve, but for some systems it makes sense, for, for some systems yeah. it makes sense to decentralize trust, for some systems it might not make much sense. And I, I'm pretty sure that both concepts will still exist in the future, decentralized and centralized systems. Probably we have to make sure that the centralized data processing systems, that they don't have full access to the data as well, because uh, privacy is becoming more and more of a concern. Um, so there's where cryptography comes in. So um, I myself don't really trust institutions or um, academia, academic institutions necessarily as well, but um, I trust the math behind the things we are doing. So I trust the cryptography that we're using. And um, for instance, I mean, the Bitcoin paper itself is not, uh, it might come from a well-established institution, but at least it's not labeled as if it was coming from a, a, a well-established institution and look at Ethereum, uh, it's like an 18-year-old guy who said like, oh, maybe we can replace the scripting language and make this Turing complete. Oh, and then he got money from Teal Foundation, boom, there's Ethereum. There's also not a well-established institution. So, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, we, I think we will still need established institutions and central authorities to some extent, but for important things and especially where it's feasible and not uh, expensive, we should aim for decentralization. But I think the trust will change. I, I want to give one example. We know about these manipulations with car, uh, car engines, the diesel scandal. And I don't think that something like this will happen again. Because nowadays, I mean, there were a lot of people that were involved. Technicians, people that wrote the code, people that tested the code. A lot of people knew about that. But it could kept secret for several, several years. But nowadays, for example, with the service I presented with your mobile phone, even if you're just the person that, I don't know, serves or changes the water bottles in the meeting room, and if you hear, OK, this team here is discussing a possibility to manipulate this kind of data. You could make a small voice note and say, I was just in a meeting attending, and they were discussing that they kind of manipulate the data from uh, engines. Mm. And if this would be documented in the blockchain, then these big companies that were involved in this kind of fraud, they would have to pay billions more in, in mm. fines. So I think the by having this kind of transparency and the possibility to timestamp any kind of data, people will have to be more honest or they will have to pay really high fines in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for, first, I, I, I want to say that I, uh, in most parts, I agree with uh, Ismail and uh, Bela. So, Bela, not, so I, I think there, you know, it's like in Star Wars, if I stay with movies, uh, there is always a dark side. There will be always people who will try to do something bad. Or they will for less money, or be I don't know. So, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go so far so to say that something like this would never happen. Maybe it will not take years that we will uh, kind of uh, get knowledge of it, or maybe it will be in different settings. But I, uh, so like you know, never say never. Uh, the um, but the uh, what, what Ismail said, I really liked it, and I would like to come back to the decentralization question by you, Sanke. So I think that uh, uh, we should go step by step here. So I think what we will observe during the next years will be kind of such um, hybrid approaches. We will have kind of um, central parties, big parties, who still do the work, and they of course get incentives for it. But they will combine it with some decentralization that they will involve all other parties to participate. They just need seconds to verify that the central party is acting according to the rules. So there is somebody who has to provide 
computing and storage power. There is somebody who has to do something. And there is incentives, like in Bitcoin or other incentives, and there will be kind of these hybrid approaches that they will open it up, like in a, through a blockchain, that if they kind of, you know, compute the hash value, they will do it because mm. of course they will get something for it. But it will take seconds for everybody who wants to see that they do it right. And it's not only about hash value, it's all about these processes. And I think this is what will be the next step, this mm. combination. So it's not like, you know, tomorrow there's only blockchains and yeah. there is no central parties anymore. It will combination, we will see some kind of uh, central parties going down, we'll see some central parties and writing it up who really better understand the new idea. It's like with the internet, you know. Yeah, yeah. Some parties won, some parties lost. It's always winners and losers. Yeah. Let, let me expand a little bit on that. This is super interesting. I, I think when we go further into the implications of making up these uh, game-like incentivation rules that, that smart contracts are most often about, right? And, and to regulate parts of real life through this made-up games, right? Then we are quickly... Um, we, we, we have to be concerned about uh, and dark and potentially dangerous sides of these games as well. So for instance, there's a very well-established um, notion in the economic research on uh, commons that when you have um, some activity that so far is uh, done um, out of an intrinsic motivation, take for instance things like Wikipedia or so, and when you introduce to such a system a monetary incentive, you can easily destroy the system. Get it, right? So, 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 so think about what we do. And this is not, not easy. This is, not, this is not, not, not an easy yes or no question, right? But uh, many of the systems we hear about today and tomorrow are about introducing monetary incentives to things like peer review. Yeah. And as you know, so far, this works just, just from the motivational standpoint, more like Wikipedia, yeah? you feel inclined to, 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 to uh, give back to your researchers, your peers community by doing peer review. So this is really something we have to keep in mind. And this is why I'm grateful for people like Alexander von Humboldt Institute, uh, because they, doing, they are doing this kind of qualitative research that we urgently need next to developing technical solutions, right, about this kind of questions. Very good. And I would like you to take the responsibility because, you know, there is libraries, there is, so we as society, we as people pay taxes for society to spend this money on something society is, thinks is crucial, like doing research, like educating people. You have money to provide this computing and storage power to run these kind of databases without looking for other incentive mechanisms. So if we as society decide that it's worse for us to have something like Wikipedia is great, and it's also chronologically ordered, you know, you can see the whole chronology of all the articles. If libraries would run this and not compete with Starbucks for places where students can kind of drink coffee and learn, but kind of do real crucial things, then this will be a great mover because we as scientists and students will for sure trust more the libraries that's your advantage than uh, others. So if we as society decide to fund such things, make it possible. You know, I, I would, yeah, I, I think these are a great point, uh, but I would like respectfully, uh, you know, argue against the, uh, the cautious thing uh, you mentioned about like gamifying economic incentive and monetary incentive. Um, I think uh, having blockchain govern uh, something called crypto economics is actually extremely beneficial. Maybe we're still in the early stage, uh, but we're moving to the right direction. The reason for that is, uh, uh, what is crypto economics? Uh, is really economics plus code. And that code actually dominates and uh, you know, explicitly tell everyone how this economic uh, uh, mechanism is gonna work. And I, I think that is about 100 times better than what, our, what we have today, which is a very ambiguous, obscure way of governing the, uh, the economic uh, mechanisms. Uh, yes, there are a lot of challenges to make that explicit code work, uh, including governance, including how to like, uh, you know, there are people trying to acting as central bank these days, uh, you know, to issue stable coins, to have like a reserve and a bond system programmed as a smart contract. Uh, but these me mechanisms, I think, could work and could work better than today because it is a transparent, basically. 
Um, talking about uh, the society, I would like the experts, what's your opinion about how soon can we expect a technology based on blockchain so that elections, local, provincial or national level, uh, starts to become a little more real participatory uh, democracy? Is there any hope for that anytime soon? Can you see that, technologically speaking? I would say the technology is uh, far enough, and I think also when we think about the elections in, in Spain, you know, when they wanted to get independent, if we think about uh, how everything would have uh, worked out differently if this technology would already be in the hands of the like normal person, I mean, what did the government do? They uh, sent police forces to ensure that people couldn't go to these election rooms. But if you were able to, uh, yeah, vote without going anywhere, then maybe the whole outcome would have been um, differently. So it really, I think your question is, is a really good one because blockchain technology can have a huge impact on, on other society yeah. questions as well. Okay, but let's stay with science and research, okay? <laughs> we can, like, like, say, vote on a good idea, okay? <laughs> Elect the next good flying concept, okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, so it's opened up basically, yeah, yeah, Alexander, yeah? I'll, I'll have to go back to the election just for <laughs> this one comment. So it's actually happening already. I just wanted to say that the mayor of Tuk, so the, where, where our company is, is super forward thinking. And uh, there were already possibilities for people, because Switzerland is extremely democratic, so to go uh, and to vote on some local... Yeah. Uh, aspects. Actually, yeah. taking this election example, it's cool and it's like the blockchain and I completely agree to time and things that, but there's one big problem that is unsolved and that is in the science world, the same problem that blockchain is not about replacing trusted third parties or like get them, like get completely rid of them, but we have, we have to have new third parties for the real world blockchain interfaces and one of this is the identity problem. So even the mayor of Zug has to have to find a way to prove the identity of, a, of somebody to, to participate in the election, right? So, and we have this example and we talk about this, right? And then we have the problem of like, how do we feed data into a blockchainified, totally immutable uh, uh, data set or whatever, if we can't trust the sensor, right? We have a talk on this, we have a talk on identity, and we should focus on these discussions as well. And then, okay, uh, and then I want to like include one more thing into blockchain, like all blockchain, and this is new ways to look at data. Yeah, it's like there are projects that deal with like today. There is like this one thing, and James said it like once in a good way. Like today, we we give data, we trust somebody with the data to do everything with it, and just give them some data. So we give some data very carefully, in most of the case in research world, right? Uh, to somebody to do everything with it, right? So in the future, we g might end up in a point where we give all data to an entity that can only do something with it and very constrained things. So think of sending all blood pressure data of all patients of Berlin. It's my favorite example to a smart contract and that just and the internal review board, IRB board, can carefully review the smart contract and can see line by line that this smart contract is only able to release average blood pressure uh, with a four weeks delay of all Berliners, for example. That would be a cool new way, right? I know, I know that it's like at the moment it's not possible because the smart contract will leak the data to all every node that evaluates the smart contract. But there are like publications and then we get into trusted hardware and everything. But Projects that work on this are calling their projects blockchainified data, whatever, because they have like, how do we constrain the access to the data? We don't want to have like one entity that is trusted with the constraint. We have several entities, right? And they call this system blockchain too. To like, so, so in this term, like the blockchain of distributed trust uh, becomes like the social, philosophical, political representation of our responsibility to constrain the access to the data. If we, if we like come up with a thing that let's get all patient data from all patients and like send it somewhere, we don't want to have just Max Planck server to trust that the data is constrained. We want to have all research institutes maybe 
uh, taking responsibility for that. Yeah? So and this is like it has to do with crypto economies, strong cryptography, new data handling ways, distributed trust, and this should be blockchain as well. Because we can like piggyback on the hype to introduce in these new decentralized data ways. This is actually the most I think we will like in the next session we will talk about this, yeah, and have talks on that. Any comments on that? Or is it okay to call this still blockchain? Or is it too far out? What would you say? You, you, Ali, 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 you command on this. Yeah, you, you as a computer, you know trusted hardware, you know how, how that these are still it? dreams, right? How, how did you call it? What kind of blockchain? Uh, no, 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 not. This is, it's, oh, this is it has like this distributed trust, strong cryptography, uh, 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 provability, or auditability. Yeah, all these things. It has no blockchain. I mean, all the blockchain projects in the future might not have a blockchain at the end, right? As a data structure. Right? Maybe. So yeah. they can, they can be something, right? But it's cool to call this blockchain as well, if I'm careful, like, enough, okay? Because it is distributed stuff, strong cryptography, and you, call, you comment on, on the feasibility or later, you, you have to go, but I, I would love to see you, like, on the next session, but okay, yeah. So uh, one thing is how do you get the, the data into the blockchain? There yeah. are projects that are working on this. Uh, Town Crier, for instance, I think it's a group from Cornell that's working on this, but <clears throat> how do you actually make sure that the data you get inside into the smart contract make sure that it's actually the data you uh, wanted to be in the smart contract? Yeah, that's, that's right, open but problem, only, only the smart contract can decrypt it, Maybe you can just expose it to the outside and only yeah, just... Yeah, but how do you make sure the authenticity of the data yeah. that comes from outside of the blockchain? Exactly. <laughs> there we have an identity problem again, right? I, I could just create 10,000 of patients, virtual patients, and just send it somewhere, right? So we have to constrain that as well. And this is a big problem, I agree, yeah? Maybe <clears throat> a useful way to think about all this is to think about use cases where actually you want to solve like existing problems and uh, you explore the problem space and then you think how could I use a blockchain or whatever technology that is there. I think that's that's the right way to approach it um, in general. Yes, and to expand a little bit on that, uh, maybe uh, there are already interesting use cases out there that you can apply in research and science. So for instance, we had this super interesting hint to uh, that cash and uh, um, zero knowledge snarks and uh, imagine that yes you can prove to your tax office if necessary yeah. that you received a certain amount of money in a, a certain time span and at the same time to the rest of the world this is completely opaque and nobody understands this and this is exciting and think about this uh, level of autonomy that you have above your own transactions and, and you can easily, uh, as an al analogy, uh, you can uh, find use cases for that, or you, I see use cases for that, in higher education and research as well, yes. It, it gives you much, much more autonomy uh, against, uh, like, yeah, enough said. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so I just wanted to like, do two things. There's lunch outside, and we continue, and everybody who wants to go to lunch just goes to lunch, uh, the other people just stay, okay? <laughs> Is that okay? And we open up the panel at the same time. Yeah? Okay, so... Or so should we just... No, we just continue. If you, want, if you are hungry, you just eat, okay? Okay, yeah. just coming back to the data point a little bit. Like, basically, uh, how do we see data in blockchain? Right, so uh, the great question is that, okay, we have all this cryptographic construction, so we have homographic computation, which means that you can do computation, like, entirely... Sorry. Sorry, I have to go. Okay. Yeah, 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 just go. Okay, excellent. Yeah, cool, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting topic, yeah. Yeah, so basically, like, uh, you, uh, we have data, on, uh, you had data, and the, uh, if we derive this from first principle, that is, like, we, you, we want to use blockchain, why? Blockchain is for decentralized trust, to create a trust among untrusted people. So why do you, uh, what, what kind of data you really want this kind of trusted services? Is your, your own data, your, your, your own generated data, your genomic data, your, your, uh, your browsing history, your all that stuff. Um, so this is like a, for data on blockchain or data's use case on blockchain is mostly about self-sovereignty of the data. Right, so you have a genomic data, you want to contribute to the scientific research, but you, want, you don't want to, like uh, everyone know that, you know, uh, maybe like uh, uh, I will go Alzheimer's like in, in 50 years. Uh, 
So how do, how do we do that? Um, the blockchain is a layer to break down the financial barriers to make the incentive work. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, things that need, need to be built on top uh, to make this actually work. And uh, several key pieces including uh, privacy computing, uh, that is like you can do computation on encrypted data and extract some information out of this. And uh, you know, homo homographic uh, uh, encryption, yeah. uh, that is like basically uh, zero knowledge proof. That is you can prove uh, something is valid and fit some property, saying that okay, uh, uh, my blood pressure is about 150. Uh, but like uh, at the same time, not revealing exactly what's your blood pressure, for example. This is the kind of a thing that a zero knowledge proof is capable of. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, these things that, uh, would need to be built on top of this incentivized layer because yeah. uh, at the end of the day, you're selling your data, you're selling yourself. So uh, this kind of incentive uh, uh, need to be realized on blockchain in a trust-free way. So yeah, that's my yeah, yeah, that's, two that's like that. the, uh, I forgot this, like the multi-party computation to like assure right. it's incentivize it that you have it in a decentralized way. Yeah? Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. Okay, okay. That's right. This was a, even the more obvious argument to call it also blockchain. Yeah. This new data handling paradigms. Yeah. So since nobody is going, like no, you I have can a, I have a okay? question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, just, I'm over here. It's it's totally okay that you just stand up, okay? Oh, just, okay. I don't know. Uh, I mean, like for lunch. Oh, sorry. Cool. <laughs> 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 totally yeah, okay that you can like, stand okay. up. <laughs> Yeah, they're really like sitting. Um, I'm a little bit confused about this conference because I'm hearing, I, I love that we're talking about blockchain and everything like that, but it was my impression that was gonna be, how is blockchain gonna help us in science with all the problems that we really, really have? Yeah. And from what I'm hearing is that there's all this great technology, but I'm not hearing a lot of, how are you gonna solve uh, professors not getting tenure because there's so many people still not, um, they're not leaving. How are they going to solve the paywall problems? How are we going to help people in countries in like Brazil? They're not trusted, their research is not trusted just because they're not at Max Planck, oh, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So I'm just saying, right, you, wow. as a, you have to move as a scientist to be, these are the actual problems in science that we really yeah. want to solve. So how is blockchain going to help us? Yeah, good question. We have like we, we create new incentive structures. We create new uh, different incentive structures. We submit things blindly but immutably, and you don't know whether it's for Max Planck's idea or for like uh, some remote uh, country in wherever. And uh, some people don't uh, accept this, and you don't know whether it's a valid. It's it's from a Reno, It's from a well-known institute or not. And you can reveal it later if you want. And but people st might still invest in it. They might they might think it's maybe from Harvard, but it's like really not from Harvard, you know. So they don't know. So we have this pseudonymity that I could like think of, right? Or we can like, have new day value flows. We have new systems that can of course be gamed, but the current system is gamed big times, right? But we just have like changing incentivation structures that we can easily build on top of blockchain systems because today we only have like one, two, three systems. Uh, we have a monolithic uh, incentivation structure. Uh, we have like all these uh, committees that like come up with uh, review in processes because they have the obligation to the taxpayer to distribute the research money in a very well-planned way, right? So it is this big effort of like grants and grant review and you plan your research for the next three years, right? Like what we address today, right? But we have a blockchain system. We can like uh, rely on this obligation to have a trustworthy way of distributing the research money and at the same time have very innovative new ways. Yeah? So this would be one answer to this, the one vision, okay? Now we're talking visions, right? We like, uh, it's like, it's like the phoenix from the ashes. Like blockchain was completely destroyed this morning. Now we rebuild it for the next one and a half days, okay? <laughs> so so j just to chime in on that a little bit yeah. also, right? So uh, if we're talking about real problems, uh, maybe like the tenure problem that I, 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 I also couldn't solve. That's why I quit the acad academia and <laughs> started a company. Uh, but what, uh, well, so, uh, but, but uh, another thing that I, uh, you just reminded me is that uh, it, it may make uh, the flow of public contribution to research funding much more easier. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, give an example here. So in Berkeley, in UC Berkeley, uh, there is a project called Bonic. And Bonic is uh, about finding aliens. Uh, so it basically, you know, uh, analyze the telescope data and try to see if there is like a plan planet that is suitable for human living. And maybe aliens, little green guys are living there. Uh, so uh, 
that project is uh, is struggling, right? So they cannot get enough funding because uh, you know who cares the finding aliens, right? So uh, but. Uh, if you think, and, and there are a lot of projects like that. So basically, you can install a software on your laptop and fold proteins for uh, medical researchers. Uh, but no one is doing that these days. Uh, now, uh, but what blockchain can enable is this kind of frictionless uh, micropayment, frictionless uh, micro contribution to uh, uh, researchers. Right, so uh, you could now actually start to run a uh, folding protein pro program on your uh, cell phone or on your laptop, uh, even your, when you're sitting at the conference. Um, and at the same time, someone, uh, some rich guy or some like a research institution who has money can directly fund this process by giving you cryptocurrency because the cryptocurrency so, uh, uh, entire friction to cross financial barriers and financial silos are so low that it not, it's not becoming a problem if uh, you're just doing like $1 of work. You can do $1 of work and still get paid, but you just couldn't do it today uh, because of the financial barriers. And that's kind of the thing, that, that, that's just one thing that can you know, immediately make me think of uh, you know, how this can help research. We have to close the panel. All right. <laughs> Lunch. Okay.